Welcome, friends. If you are just joining us with your cup of coffee, good morning to you. My name is Manisha Arial. I'm the Senior Advisor for Digital Development at Chemonix. We have been live for since 12 a.m. Eastern, and what a night it has been. As you all can see, we're still going strong. There is a lot to go through, so please stay with us. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, USAID, Chemonix, Digital Impact Alliance, IntraHealth, IREX, Save the Children, and TechChange, and all of the incredibly hardworking folks across the world helping to make this global forum a reality. And an applause to TechChange and our amazing volunteers who are ceaselessly working the back end to make this conference smooth sailing for everyone. So if you're just joining us, we have over 4,500 people registered for the conference and 16 hours of incredible sessions at the GTDF. We have two tracks in this time zone, English and French. Please pick any sessions you would like to attend and engage with your peers. If you have been with us since the beginning, thank you for staying with us. And if you are just joining us, welcome. We will now go to our third keynote of the day, War Against Truth, How Disinformation Undermines Public Trust and Democracy Across Africa with Justin Arenstein and Alan Chaboy. Okay, so with that, I invite Alan and Justin to take the main stage. Welcome. Thank you, thanks. So um, my name is Justin Orenstein and I'm a recovering investigative journalist with uh, Code for Africa. Hello, hi everyone. My name is Alan Cheboy and I'm a recovering forensic cybercrime investigator. Um, and we're um, part of a 20 country pan-African network of data analysts, um, forensic investigators and civic technologists who work with uh, frontline human rights defending organizations. Um, ranging from watchdog media and environmental rights initiatives. Um, we give a lot of technical support to our partners, and we've got feet on the ground everywhere that is dark blue on the map that you can see on the slide. And we've got in-country partners who do similar work to us in the light blue countries across Africa. Um, this very broad kind of geographic vantage um, gives us, uh, along with our kind of deep partnerships, gives us quite deep insights into the media and digital democracy ecosystems. And the, um, we were alerted quite far back, um, almost like back in 2012 already, that there was an escalating war on truth right across the continent. We were initially focused on trying to respond to misinformation or fake news, as the American media and, and European media kind of named it. Um, and we did that by trying to seed fund African fact-checking organizations so that it was Africans fact-checking African facts for African audiences. In the process of doing this, we created organizations or we seed-funded organizations like PESA Check and Africa Check and a whole range of others. But we very quickly realized that this wasn't going to be enough. And the reason this wasn't going to be enough is because toxic content we are detecting, de detecting costs real lives, as seen in the example where claims of African resistance to COVID-19 has popped up, and also disrupting fragile economies at a speed and scale that fact-checking alone could not curb. We needed to use advanced automated tools, including AI and machine learning, to match the speed and the scale of disinformation campaigns. One, the other thing we noticed is that rumor mongering loves a vacuum. It thrives very well where there are information voids and it goes viral in dark social economic chambers. In this process, it undermines trust in key institutions and in our democracies. As highlighted in this particular investigation, the lack of information in Ethiopia during the recent protests allowed digital activists to use old genocide pictures from countries such as Rwanda uh, falsifying them as evidence of protest within the country. The internet shutdown even created more of a vacuum for activists in the diaspora to fill and also made it difficult for physically fact check, uh, to physically fact check some of the claims that were popping out. Um, so, but it isn't just the crazy kind of lunatics out there. The profiteers have been very quick to capitalize on the fear and the anger and even the skepticism that powers so much of this disinformation. The parasites um, that breed off this and that thrive on it range from click by bait websites who publish very salacious misinformation content to make money from the web traffic 
as well as fraudsters who use disinformation to try and scam users, like this investigation on the screen by Alan's team that was um, looked into uh, a fraud network across six African countries that was preying on victims of COVID-19. The um, more recently, we've seen a rise of African franchise disinformation content moles, where freelance sock puppet managers and content creators are working with foreign state agencies as well as organized crime networks. And um, what they do and the reason why they're so effective is that they use um, their local contextual understanding to create content that feels authentic and resonates with um, local audiences in ways that troll farms in Eastern Europe or elsewhere in the world will never be able to do. Some of the more audacious campaigns, like the one on the screen, um, has set up like dedicated influence operations using content partners in Ghana, Nigeria and elsewhere to target African-American audiences back in the US in the run-up to the elections, the, the previous elections. Um, other campaigns have actually hijacked real African organizations, such as civil society groups, and convinced them to inadvertently amplify content or campaigns. Um, the outsourcing doesn't always luckily go smoothly. Um, sometimes protagonists lose the plot or their overreach, um, as is dem demonstrated in this awesome investigation on the screen at the moment by our friends at Graphica and Stanford University. Um, in the investigation, they exposed how French and um, Russian networks in the Central African Republic, Libya, Mali, and elsewhere across West Africa were so busy attacking each other and counter-attacking each other, including even using specially commissioned cartoons that Facebook and other platforms eventually detected them and removed the entire network. So, and it doesn't only stop there. The foreign campaigns appear to be inspiring domestic copycats here back in Africa. As shown by this investigation by our partners, the Atlantic Council, the DFR Labs, uh, that exposed a network of 300 Facebook sock puppet accounts and fake media sites connected to Uganda's information ministry that targeted opposition parties. Facebook eventually took down the proxy profiles to the indignation of officials. Furthermore, this in domestic disinformation networks aren't new. We helped expose a state capture crime, crime cabal linked with former South African President Jacob Zuma as far back as 2017. The network used a, a, a fake news site and sock puppet social media accounts created by troll firms in, back in India and managed by a British PR firm to smear investigative journalists and corruption busting officials using race baiting and attacks on women. Our exposure led to the collapse of the high profile UK spin doctor company called Bell, Bell Pottinger. The use of fake news sites is evolving. In Kenya and elsewhere in East Africa, we are now seeing almost weekly use of fake front page newspapers, uh, images as the one you can see on the screen for politically motivated disinformation campaigns. And this comes from supporters of both the ruling parties and the oppositions. These are cheap to make and they are quick to produce and they go viral very, very fast. Increasingly, copycats have begun appearing right across the continent. But the biggest casualty of all of this is public trust. Global research by organizations such as the Reuters Institute for the uh, Study of Journalism at um, Oxford University indicate that Africans are far more worried about disinformation than almost any audience elsewhere in the world. And as the trust implodes, ironically, it creates even more of an information void for these peddlers of misinformation to fill. Um, the, the fight back, though, has started by organizations such as ours and some of the partners that we've mentioned. Um, for example, our partners at Global um, Disinformation Index are systematically analyzing the structural vulnerabilities inside media organizations and the ad industry itself, advertising industry, to figure out where the weaknesses are that are used to compromise their internal quality control systems. We're currently working with GDI um, to try and create early warning tools based on super robust methodology and also real-time data that warns advertisers when they try and place advertising next to known disinformation purveyors. The idea is to starve the profiteers. We want to take the profit motive out of this work. 
We are also tackling the big blind spot for disinformation analysis, the so-called dark social chat apps like WhatsApp and Telegram. It is currently impossible to digitally monitor WhatsApp and similar services. We are therefore using human sentiments in places like Niger, where we worked with Chemonix and BFR labs to monitor the recent elections. We are now replicating the model in Cote d'Ivoire and elsewhere. We are also aware that simply exposing disinformation doesn't necessarily neutralize or stop a campaign. Influence campaigns use a whole of society strategies and need a whole of society solutions. We are therefore networking the efforts of teams such as our own and DFA Labs, GDI Institute and Reuters Institute with local media and civil society watchdogs across the continent. We are using, as you can see in this slide, a combination of offline visual communication and community mobilization underpinned by online bots and resources. Yeah, and we're trying to amplify these grassroots efforts and kind of um, data-driven investigations by building a broader continental ecosystem of rapid responders. And that includes, for example, working with and co-founding who's um, African Infodemic Response Alliance um, that tries to connect the African CDC and other global health experts with in-country, on-the-ground media and researchers so that they get direct access to global experts who are super credible to help debunk some of this content. Other networks that we're helping to, to kind of grow include Africa Facts, which is a, um, a group of uh, fact-checking organizations across the continent, and UNESCO's brand new network of Francophone fact-checkers across um, West and soon going to be Central Africa. It's important to support these organizations because the problem is simply too big for any one network or any one organization or initiative to consistently counter. It evolves just too quickly. So we're taking a leaf out of the disinformation strategist's own playbook and we're franchising our solutions. We've set up um, hub and spoke networks of disinfo research partnerships across the continent, which Alan's team of analysts and our own teams of fact checkers then help give forensic research support to grassroots media. Those media have already established check desk fact checking teams inside 28 newsrooms across East Africa, um, and they reach tens of millions of people on a daily basis as a way of counteracting it. One of, the, one of the earliest examples of this is on the screen at the moment, an organization based out of Kenya called Piga Farimbi. We're about to replicate that model now into West Africa. But even then, scale is what's important. We need to hit a certain critical mass to be able to, to have a real lasting impact on, on the disinformation space across the continent. And we'd love more uh, watchdog organizations to join. Um, so we've created links on the slides uh, um, above for you to go and look at the projects and explore the organizations. And um, we've also created a link on this slide um, to direct you direct to our software repository where all the digital tools that we've built are open source. Steal them, reuse them, please take them and, and kind of customize them for your own uses. Some of them are building on successes elsewhere on the continent as well. And then finally, if you'd like to join the community, we've also shared a link to the Slack uh, where we all are. And there are almost 3000 African civic technologists, nine investigators for you to collaborate with. Um, a lot of this work uh, only is effective if it's transfrontier and kind of multi-organizational, because again, no single organization can really move the needle. Thanks very much. If you have any questions, please, we'd love to, to answer and, and don't be scared to grill us. Sir. That was incredible. We're getting a lot of uh, comments uh, on the chat. And uh, as we try to sort of like gather them, uh, we'll try to get as many questions as possible uh, in the time that we have. But um, since I have you both here, <laughs> let me start with a question of my own, right? Social media platforms, um, you're saying, are at the root of many of these misinformation, disinformation problems that we're seeing, right? Um, yeah. Yet you both partner with platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp on some of your initiatives. What's up with that? What's the thinking behind this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is contentious in, in some activist circles, but our, our approach is that 
Um, social media platforms have created many of these problems, or they've helped create a space for these problems to grow. And we can't ignore them, and we can't sanction them. What we need to do is co-opt them and ensure that they help create solutions that are effective, that are not, not whitewashing, that are real, impactful, practical solutions in concert with the, the kind of ecosystem outside of those platforms. So the only way that we found that we could really make sure that this is not a PR exercise is to work with them and hold them accountable um, alongside them. Right. Yeah, and, and just to add on that, uh, we also maintain research and editorial independence in such partnerships. Yeah. Therefore, that brings that impartiality when we, when we deal with uh, the social media companies. Yeah, we are very strict um, believers in this keeping a wall between you know, people with funding and money and those who do the actual editorial research. There's virtually no communication between those. And it's seen in the past, for example, us investigating some of our partners. We investigated the World Bank at the same time that they were funding us and exposed large um, discrepancies in the way they were managing grantees and those people impacted by infrastructure development. So the kind of team that Alan's built and that many of our partners have built are not scared of biting the hand that feeds them if they need to be held accountable. Right. Right. So, but not, but not all governments and countries are on board with the concept of independent uh, no. citizen accountable media, right? Many are also embroiled in like civil conflicts. How do you fact check authoritarian governments and how do you avoid like partisanship during like civil conflicts, for example? It's, it's really difficult. And I mean, one of the more challenging places to do fact checking at the moment in Africa is Ethiopia, um, where because the government has been trying pretty hard to ensure that the narrative doesn't spill into hate speech. It's clamped down on that open space in the country. But that's made it really difficult to physically get out into conflict zones and fact check the claims by both parts of that conflict. Also, ironically, as I think Alan pointed out, um, an internet shutdown creates a vacuum that immediately misinformation and disinformation actors jump into. And so we saw that when the, when the internet was shut down in Ethiopia, you have lots of people in the diaspora who are activists and pushing a very strong line, jump into that void and fill it with counter narratives. How do, we, how do we try and respond to that? We ensure that there are regional networks. So even if a country goes dark because the net's off, you've got people who've got context and experience and networks based in surrounding countries who can help do fact checking immediately, but also you then tap into these external diaspora communities and networks and you fact check in real time. The, the trick here is to try and neutralize or debunk a misleading claim as soon as it's made. Because once it's taken hold, it's incredibly difficult to then actually um, stop it. It consists, consistently kind of pops up again and again. Right. So I'm going to uh, sort of like, you know, ask you a question that we see in the chat. Um, yeah. And the question is, oftentimes journalists fall into the trap of wanting to break news first, and then they run the risk of accidentally reporting fake yeah. news. How can respected journalists balance the need to break news first and then the need to fact check? So it's difficult, especially when moves, news is moving very fast. What we are seeing many media realizing that quality um, uh, kind of content and growing reliable, consistent audiences means that you should actually just slow down a bit. There's no way you're going to beat breaking events on social media where the media and journalists play a good role is adding context and verifying what people are seeing. So we're seeing more media doing that. Um, there are other ways. People are starting to plug in databases into their their production systems. So you automatically start getting an alert if you are writing about something or using an image or sharing a link that's already been debunked. And this is called claim matching. And this is where partnerships with people like Google and others are important because they aggregate all of this, this, this debunked information across the world. But there are also other ways. I mean, our organization and other organizations actually fact check the media themselves. And that whole thing about holding the watchdogs accountable is extremely important because if you are going to try and hold political parties and other interest groups accountable, you need to hold yourself to the same level of, um, of verif verified facts. So we do that very proactively and we've had a pretty good response from media in terms of correcting errors that have been that have slipped through. 
Right. But fact checking is a very manual process, right? It's yeah. almost like handcrafted solution that requires like highly skilled human analysts and researchers. Considering the size of the problem, how can it ever realistically scale up to make a real impact? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a bit of a cottage industry. And I mean, it's right. crucial because that human fact checking is almost the, the fuel that um, the rest of the network uses. But the reality is that you'll find fact checkers sometimes in the same country refact checking the same thing over and over again. And they're reinventing the wheel because they don't know that someone else 100 kilometers away has already done it. So some of the efforts at the moment to try and scale this includes networking folk so that they share their databases and they know that someone else has fact checked it. They obviously need to trust them to figure out whether they can reuse that information. But in addition to that, folk like Alan's team and some of our other colleagues are using um, AI and machine learning tools that can start recognizing the trends and the kinds of content or recognize the sources where these come from. And they create early warning signals that both media as well as um, fact checkers then look at. Even that on its own is never going to solve the problem completely. You need, as Alan was saying, a whole of society type solution. So we need to get into schools. We need to make um, skepticism of things online almost second nature for people where they're not just checking the facts because that's too laborious for most people. People need to check the source. Where does the information that you're consuming come from? And is it somewhere that is credible and can be trusted? How do you keep your people safe, Justin, Alan, either of you? Well, <laughs> it's a balance because right. a big part of our ethos is that there are no anonymous, there's no anonymous reporting. Yeah, the fact checker, the copy editor, the editor, the graphic person, they're all named on a fact check so that there's no hidden conspiracy behind fact checking or behind disinformation investigations. And that means that they become targets. So just this week, we've been trying to defend some of our fact checkers in Uganda um, by a, a large network of armchair activists across Europe who upset that um, with some of the fact checks that have been done. And some of it is trolling. Some of it's very abusive. A former editor of ours in South Africa was trolled by um, a network that included photoshopped images of her on naked bodies and so forth. Um, some of it's just like, you know, like a hectoring, but also there are often calls for local supporters to take things into their hands and do something physically. And in those cases, as we've seen with the BBC and others, AFP in Ethiopia, sometimes you have to pull your people out. Um, you know, your fact checkers are always local, they're based in a country and they're of that country, but sometimes you need to actually pull them out until things have calmed down. And that takes resources and it also takes the ability to act quickly, which is extremely difficult. So it's an evolving field, but again here we're building on the experience that media and other rapid responders have developed over, over many years. Um, but it's never, never an easy thing. And I think often people don't appreciate just how much risk these fact checkers and researchers put themselves at just to shine a light on some of the information. Right. Um, so I'll pull another question from the chat. This is from Marianne. Um, since the majority of African communities remain offline, yet remain affected by mis- and disinformation, what efforts have been made to protect these communities from malicious content, seeing as they are most likely to engage in violence motivated by this false information? Yeah, so I mean, this is a reality that you know, often the misinformation or the conspiracy theories originate in the digital space somewhere, often actually in North America or Europe from you know, far right or religious kind of communities and groups. And then it cycles down to local communities, usually through WhatsApp. Um, and you'd be amazed, even the most offline communities, someone has access to a phone somewhere and either a chat service or it's for mobile money and other things, or to WhatsApp. And then from there, it goes to word of mouth. And good research by a whole range of people has shown that often those people trust relatives more than they do authoritative figures. So if an uncle or an aunt tells you something that they've read on WhatsApp, word of mouth then spreads it. The only way to counteract it is to use that same network. So we've got outreach programs in places like Cote d'Ivoire and in Niger and elsewhere, where you're reaching out to kids at school, you're reaching out to women's groups and health groups, 
and you're showing them better sources of information, but also you're creating like WhatsApp um, check lines where if they come across some information, they can drop the link or the photograph or the video into it and it will automatically tell them if it's in a database, it's proven it's it's been debunked or a fact checker if it's not there. A fact checker will look into it and within 24 hours, try and give a reasonable response. It's still not perfect, but we are increasingly seeing um, kind of creative ways of bridging that digital divide. One of the slides that I think Alan shared um, also showed how we're using graffiti, almost like um, uh, you know, kind of stencil type graffiti with um, image driven messaging that debunks some of the health and some of the gender types of disinformation that's been that's been spread um, and often is a seed for for hate speech or for for ethnic violence on the continent. Right. Uh, another question from uh, Thomas. Uh, how do you confirm that the source is credible in a constantly changing information environment? I think sort of, yeah. you know, Thomas is probably trying to um, get some tips from you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's difficult. Um, but yeah, again, yeah, old school journalism is that you try and triple source everything. So don't try not to rely on a single source. You need to get it verified. People need to substantiate. Um, we try and find the original document for the original piece of resource, because uh, or research at least, because often even a credible source might misunderstand or misquote something, especially if it's a piece of scientific research. So we try and do that level of verification um, where the authority itself is potentially being compromised. Like, for example, in a country where potentially an electoral authority has been captured or the presidency has been captured. What we then try and do is try and get a cross um, uh, consensus of what the facts might be by other credible organizations in that country. It's extremely important that you multi-source but also that you don't just stick to one part of the political spectrum. You need to get a cross section across the spectrum so that people will find in those sources you mentioned an organization or an expert that they feel that they can trust and can rely on. Awesome. I think we're coming towards the end of this time. It just like flew. But uh, so this will probably be my last question to you. Um, this is from Jesus. Um, how do we map communities vulnerability to disinformation and misinformation? And could this be a way of building resilience to infodemics and tackle root causes of the problems? Yeah, it's an evolving it's an evolving philosophy. I mean, in intelligence agencies, they've already done this at national level and they've mapped countries that they believe are vulnerable to influence operations by their competitors at nation state level. But figuring out at a sub level which communities are, are more vulnerable is a more difficult and nuanced thing. And actually, we're working with um, DFR Labs and the Atlantic Council at the moment. Um, and some partners at a, uh, an organization called the DT Institute to develop a model for Africa that we can do this on a streamlined, uh, in a stream streamlined way uh, for, you know, create a uh, disinformation vulnerability assessment type of index. The, the problem is it takes resources and it'll take time to do properly. And then you've got to constantly redo it because these things evolve. Right. Oh, that's so if anyone wants, if anyone's got good ideas and wants to collaborate, shut, we'd be very keen. Right, right. Anything else you want to add to this conversation that I haven't asked you, Justin and Alan? I think, I mean, I've spoken a lot, so Alan, jump in. But just the one thing I want to say is that we're not alone and no one's alone in this. There are, there are organizations right across the world now that are doing awesome work around this, from you know, pioneers like Bellingcat and DFR Labs and others through to the more recent entrance into this field. And as the field grows, the problem is that it's fragmenting. We need to do more collaboration. So what I would urge and want to say is that we need to recognize the early pioneers who built awesome foundations, but now we need to start consolidating and creating mechanisms for fast, rapid collaboration. Alan, I'm sure you've got something more to add to that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just one more thing that I wanted to uh, add is that it, it doesn't only stop at fact checking individual claims. We need to yeah. go a step further to fact check and to also uh, try and get evidence for networks and coordinated behavior online. So for everyone out there, if you're actually doing the fact checking of individual claims, have that in a database somewhere and you'll be able to see indicators of someone's hitting 
somewhere else, trying to pull all the resources together to share individual claims. And if you do that compilation or network analysis, as we call it, you'll be able to see the source of these claims. And once you kill that particular point, you'll be able to stop most of the disinformation that you see online. Awesome. Exactly. We want to unmask the puppet masters. Right. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our conversation. Thank you both very much for this like really enlightening talk and this very rich discussion um, following the talk. Um, you know, for our audience members, what I'd like to say is that um, we have, this is like almost like an arc, the, uh, the interesting conversations throughout the day about disinformation, misinformation, that is pretty big theme in this conference. So please stay with us. And if you can't stay, please visit us again because the uh, conversations and all of these uh, sessions will be in the platform for, 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 for you to sort of like, you know, go back to again. So thank you, Alan and Justin. Thank you very much, both of you.